All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky for January 2021. And let's hope that 2021 is a better year than 2020 for all of us. But coming up this month, we have the Quadrantids meteor shower. We have the Cygnus region of the Milky Way to enjoy. There are plenty of targets for star trackers in Orion that I will discuss. Mercury joins Jupiter, Saturn and the Moon in the evening skies. And we also see the greatest eastern elongation of Mercury. But before we deep dive into all of that and more, a quick message from the sponsors of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. There are thousands of inspiring classes covering a huge range of creative topics such as graphic design, photography, videography, freelancing and more. I'm sure many of you watching this video will appreciate Ian Norman's class on nightscapes, an incredible introduction to all things landscape astrophotography. Or how about James Manning's Astronomy for Starscapes which will help you make sense of the night sky and plan your astrophotographs with ease. I've been using Skillshare for just over a year now and I've used it for all sorts sorts of stuff. There are lots of good classes on freelancing and running a business and also Adobe Premiere classes that help me edit these videos. Premium members get access to all of those courses and you can try as many as you like and if you want to join along just follow the link in the video description and you get two months completely free of Skillshare Premium. Okay so starting in the northern hemisphere where we're now in the depths of winter and northern light season is in full swing. But as the sun sets in the west, you'll see a little bit of the Great Rift along with the Cygnus region of the Milky Way in the west. And as the night goes on, the Cygnus region comes down lower to the horizon and sort of sets in the northwest. And you're left with a bit of the Cygnus region up to Cassiopeia. And of course you have Andromeda, M31, the spiral galaxy just to the left of the Cassiopeia region. As the night goes on, that faint section of the Milky Way continues to come down lower to the northern horizon into the early hours of the morning. But if I just come back to the evening skies and swing to the south, you will see as darkness falls, Orion already in the southeast as darkness falls continues to rise high into the southern skies crossing the southern meridian between 10 and 11 p.m. local time and as the night goes on Orion continues down into the southwest but as Orion is crossing the southern meridian this is the best time to get your star tracker out and photograph it because this is the highest point it will reach in the night sky for your location. So zooming into Orion, there is of course the Orion Nebula M42, which is visible to the naked eye from a dark sky location. And this example image here I took just last month. And then if we come to Orion's belt and the star Alnitak, you'll see the flame and horsehead nebula Again, here's an example image that I took just last month. Zooming out again and back to Rigel, Orion's foot, you will find the Witch Head Nebula. And it's a very faint nebula, it's a reflection nebula. So it's reflecting the light of stars, not emitting its own light. And again, here's an example image I took just last month. And coming up this month, I'll be sharing a video about how I took all of these images using the Skywatcher Star Adventurer 2. So make sure to hit subscribe if you don't want to miss out on that video. But zooming out, we have of course the winter circle or the winter hexagon. If I just draw it on the screen for you. Made up of bright stars from various winter constellations. And there's a faint section of the Milky Way, which runs through this region of the night sky as well. And there's just lots of bright, colourful stars and large deep sky objects such as the Orion Nebula and Pleiades and Hyades surrounding Aldebaran. It's just a really beautiful area of the night sky. And as the night goes on, we'll start to see Leo the Lion 
rising into the east as well. But Leo is more of a spring constellation, so I'll talk about that in a future video. As for the planets this month, so after the Great Conjunction, Jupiter and Saturn continue to be visible close together in the southwest evening skies. But as the month goes by, they head closer and closer to the sun. And you'll also see Mercury doing the opposite. So Mercury heading further away from the sun. And by the end of the month, we can no longer see Jupiter and Saturn, but Mercury is continuing to get higher into the evening skies. And on the 24th is where Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation, and it will be 18.6 degrees away from the sun, shining at a magnitude of minus 0.7. It then reaches its highest point in the night sky three days later on the 27th. But if I come back to the 14th, it's a really good opportunity to get Saturn, Jupiter, Mercury, and a very thin crescent moon in the same image. Now it might be quite difficult to get Saturn and Jupiter because they are so close to the sun and so low on the horizon, but you should have better luck with Mercury and the thin crescent moon. As for Mars, it can be found high in the south in the evening skies and it continues to fade this month going from minus 0.2 to 0.4 and as the night goes on it heads down to the western horizon and sets between 2 and 3 a.m. local time. Turning to the eastern morning skies you'll find Venus rising before the sun but as the month goes by it gets closer and closer to the sun and so it spends less time in the morning skies before sunrise but if I come back to the 11th you see a good opportunity there to get a very thin crescent moon and Venus in the same shot. On to the southern hemisphere where as darkness falls the large and small Magellanic clouds are found very high in the sky. And of course we have this beautiful region of the Milky Way with the Crux constellation and the Carina Nebula. It's also a good time for a Milky Way arch panorama facing east where you have the what's known as the Winter Circle region in the Northern Hemisphere, but is known as the Southern Summer Circle in the Southern Hemisphere. You have Sirius at the apex of the arch and then coming down to Carina and the Crux. If I swing to the North, as the night continues, the Southern Summer Circle continues to climb into the Northern skies. And you'll notice now Orion very high in the sky and upside down to what we're used to in the northern hemisphere. But as Orion is crossing the northern meridian it's the best time to get up the star tracker and photograph it because it's the highest it reaches in the sky. So you have of course the Orion Nebula M42. It's a really good beginner target and this is an example photo that I took just last month and then zooming out to Orion's belt and the star Alnitak is where you'll find the flame and horsehead nebulae again another example image that i took just last month and zooming out so that we can come to rigel orion's foot and that's where you'll find the witch head nebula it's a very faint nebula because it's a, a reflection nebula so it's reflecting the light of stars it's not emitting its own light but again here's an image i took just last month and all of these images will be released in a video on my channel this month about the Star Adventurer 2 Star Tracker. So make sure to hit subscribe if you don't want to miss out on that. And then as the night goes on, the Southern Summer Circle continues down to the Western skies. And then if you happen to be up 
in the very early hours of the morning you can get another Milky Way arch panorama with the Norma region of the Milky Way all the way over to the southern summer circle. As for the planets, after the Great Conjunction, Jupiter and Saturn continue to be close in the evening skies in the southwest. But as the month goes by, they get closer and closer to the sun. But Mercury is doing quite the opposite. So Mercury is heading further and further away from the sun until the 24th where Mercury is at its greatest eastern elongation from the Sun where it will be 18.6 degrees away from the Sun shining at a magnitude of minus 0.7 before it starts to head closer to the Sun once again. Zooming out you'll find Mars high in the northwest as darkness falls and then as the night goes on it makes its way down to the western horizon and sets at about 1am local time and swinging around to the eastern morning skies you'll find Venus climbing into the east before the sun but as the month goes by it heads closer and closer to the sun but if we just come back to the 10th or the 11th that's when you'll find Venus nice and close to a thin crescent moon so a nice photographic opportunity there on the 13th you'll find Saturn Jupiter an extremely thin crescent moon and Mercury in the evening skies but the ecliptic is not at a favorable angle for the southern hemisphere at this time of year so it may be very difficult to photograph these as they'll be very low on the horizon just after sunset a day later on the 14th you may have a bit of better luck photographing just mercury with a thin crescent moon in the evening skies as for the special events this month we have the quadrantids meteor shower now it's always difficult to follow in the footsteps of the geminids especially when they fell on a new moon last month but the quadrantids can produce up to 120 meteors an hour however there will be a waning gibbous moon this year, so you can definitely expect rates to be a lot lower than that. The meteor shower is active from the end of December till around January the 12th, but doesn't peak until around the 3rd and the 4th, but the peak is very short-lived. So with the Perseids and the Geminids, the peak lasts at least a day or two, so everyone around the world can enjoy the peak. But the Quadrantids only peaks for a few hours, so you have to be lucky to be on the night side of Earth as it peaks. The International Meteor Organization currently guessed that the peak is going to occur around 2.30 p.m. UTC time. So if that holds true, Western USA and Western Canada are looking like the forerunners to experience the peak. However, these guesses are very difficult to predict and meteor showers always tend to defy what the experts think is going to happen. The radiant point of the meteor shower is at the northernmost tip of the constellation Bootes, which is not far from the asterism the Big Dipper. So it heavily favours the northern hemisphere. And those in the southern hemisphere would be lucky to see any quadrantids. Now you might be thinking that meteor showers are named after the constellation within which the radiant is, which is true, but the quadrantids are named after the constellation which no longer exists, Quadrans Muralis. Back in 1922, when the International Astronomical Union set about standardising the night sky and splitting it into 88 defined constellations with an area, Quadrans Muralis wasn't included, but the name of the meteor shower lives on. But long story short, if you have clear skies on the night of the 3rd and the morning of the 4th, and you're in the Northern Hemisphere, just get out there and try your luck. For those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, the meteor activity outlook is not very good. You have the Alpha Centaurids becoming active at the end of the month, but they don't peak until February, so I'll talk about them more in next month's video. But even then on the peak, you only get two or three or four meteors per hour, so it's a very minor meteor shower. 
And unfortunately, that's all I have for you this month. It's a very quiet start to the year. Those of you at mid to high northern latitudes would be wise to keep an eye on solar activity for some northern lights. And don't forget to download the app ISS Detector so you can be informed about any ISS passes for your local area in the coming days. Me personally, I think I'm going to get the star tracker out and do some tracking. And I'm currently working on a video where I track the targets in Orion because I've just been sent the Star Adventurer 2 so I'm putting that through its paces and I'll be creating a review of that tracker. So make sure to hit subscribe if you don't want to miss out on that. Now on to the hashtag, Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject to photograph and people upload their images to social media using the hashtag Wittens and I pick my favourite three to win a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a What's in the Night Sky t-shirt. And first place wins a photo view photography guidebook of their choice. Last month's target was the Winter Circle, but immediately somebody in the comments said, why didn't you choose the Great Conjunction? And I face palmed. So this month, I'm going to be doing a double prize giveaway, three for the Winter Circle and three for the Great Conjunction. So starting with the Winter Circle, in third place was Miguel with this beautiful image of the Winter Circle and some air glow above a lake. And if you happen to speak Portuguese, you can head over to his YouTube channel where he made an astro vlog about taking this photograph and many others as well. In second place was Jacob Sana with this beautiful winter scene taken with an astro modified camera and his amazing detail in the hydrogen alpha emission nebulae in that region of the sky as well. Very nicely done. And in first place was this image from Sirius Stargeezer and the quality of this image is superb the colors are amazing i love that balance between the the cool blue and the warm yellow and if you head over to his instagram page you can check out the exif data to see just how much work he put into this shot and the result speaks for itself as for the great conjunction in third place is this image from godwood photography where he's taken his kid out to experience and witness the Great Conjunction. And a lot of my memories from my early childhood involve significant astronomical events. So this image really invoked quite an emotional response from me. So well done to Godwood Photography. In second place was this image from Mark Simpson, a very simple image, but I just love the blue tones. And then you've got these Kelvin Holmes cloud disturbances in the foreground, which are quite rare. You get these really gorgeous, tendril wave patterns in the clouds and then he's also got good detail in jupiter saturn and some of jupiter's galilean moons there as well so well done to mark simpson and in first place was this time lapse over on twitter by matt joes where you have saturn and jupiter along with the thin crescent moon set in over the London skyline. And you should go over and check out Matt Joe's amazing YouTube channel where he made a vlog about capturing the Great Conjunction. And you might be quite amazed at the equipment that he used to do it as well. But I love seeing astrophotography from heavily light polluted areas, especially at a time when people are stuck in lockdowns and travel restrictions and can't quite get out and about and access dark skies. So amazing job by Matt. And just go check out his YouTube channel. It's really awesome. This month, let's do something a little different. Slightly unfair, but let's go with images taken on a star tracker. So unfortunately, I know not everybody has their own star tracker, but let's go for something a little different. Anyway, thanks for tuning in to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.